Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to um, welcome you to uh, what I know is going to be a very interesting and stimulating event based on the few minutes I've had with our, our guest speaker, Mary Woolley. We were already having a very interesting conversation, and we'll continue this now for, for everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding right across the street. And I'm very, very happy today that the Dickey Center and the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy have joined together to co-sponsor uh, this very interesting uh, event. Um, in the academy uh, and at Dartmouth, uh, our focus on health and in general in many ways tends to uh, the research side of the equation and often uh, at times uh, to the detriment, if you will, of our understanding of how you know, our research can have a real impact uh, in its implementation, uh, as well as understanding the very policies uh, that govern public health and public funding uh, for health research. I think you know, those of you who know me, I'm very fascinated on this uh, conjunction of public policy, public issues, and the academy. Uh, and it's, to me, a, a subject of never-ending uh, fascination. And fortunately, our speaker today is really uniquely able uh, to help us make that connection. Mary Woolley is the president of Research America, a not-for-profit, nonpartisan, grassroots public education and advocacy organization that strives to make medical and health research a high, higher national priority. As such, she operates among, between, and across elected and appointed public officials, researchers in the public, private, and academic sectors, and the media and community leaders. One might call her a public health translator as she works with so many constituencies, each with its own language and understanding concern um, health and medical research, something we share in common, you know, diplomats, uh, you know, trying to understand a lot of languages. Uh, Mary is a native of Chicago. I'm very proud to say also being a Chicago native. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Stanford and an MA from San Francisco State University. She began her work in the health field as San Francisco Project Director for the then largest ever NIH-funded clinical trial, the Multiple Risk Factor Intervention Trial. In 1981, she became administrator of the Medical Research Institute of San Francisco and in 1986 was named the Institute's Executive Director and CEO. She has served as President and CEO of Research America since 1990. And over her career, Mary's writing on science advocacy and research-related topics has appeared in many important venues, including uh, the New York Times and Washington Post, Science, Nature, Issues in Science and Technology, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, The Scientist, and others. And she is the recipient of many important awards for her work on behalf of medical research. And I can't think of an agenda more important than yours. So we're very happy to welcome uh, Mary Woolley to Dartmouth. Mary. Thank you very much, Ken, and uh, my thanks to everyone who uh, made this uh, trip possible for me and gave me the opportunity to talk to a couple of, of classes of students today. It really stimulated my thinking in ways that, frankly, members of Congress don't. <laughs> so it was really a special opportunity. So I was thinking about uh, being here at Dartmouth and the people I know who are associated with Dartmouth. So the first person who came to mind was our former Surgeon General, Dr. C. Everett Koop. Uh, 
who's been um, an honorary member of the Board of Research America since um, our inception in 1989 and has become a good friend. And you can see here um, his image from a public service campaign that we started in 1993. It had a television component as well. And it was evergreen. It was quite extraordinary at the time. Um, it was kept alive as a public service ad, meaning that stations broadcast this on, t on their television networks for six years because they got so much good feedback about it. And people just recognize this man and um, feel uh, so strongly about the caliber of his leadership. Well, what you may or may not know is that he got married last Saturday, two days ago, in Philadelphia. He's 94 years old. And he married um, a, a woman who I have not met. I wasn't able to make it to the wedding. But in characteristic Dr. Coop in the moment style, the wedding was webcast, and you can still catch it on the web if you like. So the point I want to make, though, with this slide is one about money. And we do talk about money quite a lot in our work because we're trying to, as Ken described it, make research for health a higher national priority. And that has a policy component and a funding priority. That means we want more money to go into it. So we often do talk about money. And we try to frame our conversations about money in ways that people can relate to that don't get bogged down in how much else are we spending money on uh, with our federal and our tax dollars. So here you can see the comparison using that wedding um, uh, opportunity that the American wedding industry totaled $42 billion uh, last year. And when you think about what that money, all discretionary, of course, we're not talking about tax dollars here, what that money could do if you put it toward, or even a small fraction of it, toward other uses, for example, public and private investment combined on global health research could keep that going for four years. And what do we mean by global health research? We mean research that is primarily conducted with the, the goal being assistance to underdeveloped or partly de less developed uh, nations, although we clearly will benefit from it as well in this country. We keep track on a year-by-year -year basis, and our latest um, uh, report in this regard will be coming out quite shortly, but I don't have it today. But just a few years ago, you can see the basis for that number that I just um, used in the comparison with the wedding industry. And you can see that although these are billions of dollars here, adding up to 9.4 approximately billion dollars, um, it's, it's not really that much compared to a lot of other ways we spend money. Now, on that money theme, just for a minute, and I'm going to show you um, some public opinion poll data at several points during this talk. Uh, so this is just the first of, of several. But this is um, a question that we have asked uh, for years, sometimes about research generally for health, for health, this time about global health. And we always get just about the same percentage of people ranging between 60 to 65, 67 percent, year after year, no matter what's going on in the economy, saying that they would pay a dollar more a week in taxes. And this is that real rubber meets the road question, would you do more? Um, and as, as you can see, this substantial percentage say yes, a very telling fact. Now, it's also uh, the case that people say, although they're a little bit split on this, that it's important for the United States to work to improve health globally through research. Um, there is that 19% that say it's not important, and that's interesting. Why? Why would they say it's not important? And, and we know a little bit, not a lot. We don't have conclusive data on that not important group. But first of all, they're not demographically uh, one kind, one type of person or another. They're spread across demographics, socioeconomically speaking. Um, but they're t they tend to be anti-US government involvement in anything outside this country. And that makes sense. You know, we understand that. But 19% is not a significant negative 
um, percentage when you're talking about trying to change and influence public policy. That said, we're still trying to get that 34% up higher. Um, another kind of question around uh, that, that same idea, and this is very recent, just February this year, has to do with leadership. The all, and it is, this is a very important term for Americans. They want us to be a leader in a whole range of enterprises. And you can see here this large 69% saying it's very important that the U.S. be a global leader, leader in medical health and scientific research. We have some of this data by state. We don't happen to have any for New Hampshire, so I'm just showing you uh, California here. And the important thing here is that people want their state, as well as the nation, to be a leader in a lot of things. They don't like the idea that they're going to cede leadership to other states, much less other nations. For us, the key thing is that when these questions like this are asked, um, we're the only group that we're aware of, and I'm quite, actually quite sure we are the only group, that when we commission polls, we ask about medical research. We ask about science and technology. Lots of times they're not asked about, so people make the mistaken observation that our population generally doesn't care about those topics. That isn't true. They just may not have been asked about them as part of uh, uh, polling work or other conversation. This is also from California um, because we happened only to have asked it there. We were just kind of curious as we were doing the poll there. We were wondering whether people will say that they've done anything to improve global health. And you can see, I think, from the responses here, first of all, that overwhelmingly, you know, 73% say no, they haven't. And then those who have said yes are thinking, we, we can tell by these, observ these uh, comments, are thinking more about the health of the globe, the health of the planet, than they are about the health of individuals living on the planet, especially outside the United States. So the mindset um, for global health, this, and this was very helpful to people in the state of California who were trying to put together a new university, statewide university emphasis on global health, it was interesting to them, as it should be, that the uh, population of California hadn't made that connection automatically to personal and population health so much as the health of the planet. And consistent with that, and this is now a national survey again, but we saw the same thing in California. Uh, we asked people if they could identify somebody. Who comes to mind when you think about global health? And you can see the high profile names given here, but you don't see at least a living scientist, right? And that's because, and I'll get to this uh, later in my remarks as well, it's because the science community is essentially invisible in this country. And that is a problem because they're trusted in concept, but people can't put a human face on the science community, especially the, the, the community we know about and are committed to in my organization, the research for health community. Just can't put a contemporary face on it. And that gets in the way of advocacy, which means it gets in the way of making it a higher national priority. So um, all this said, it is a higher priority in this administration than it was in the past administration. And that's not a political comment. It's just an observation. But you can see here Secretary Clinton talking about her commitment, and it is being felt throughout the State Department, to working to assist other nations in developing their own um, material conditions is the way she describes it. But she has put in place some strong outreach programs in science and research for science, including this new Science Envoys program. And you can read about it a little bit here, uh, particularly for the, for the Muslim world, sending outstanding leaders in this country um, who are comfortable with or themselves have backgrounds in that culture 
who can work with their counterparts and try to foster more collaboration. And we're very proud of the fact that Elias Zerhouni, the former director of the NIH, is now on the Research America board and was selected for as one of these envoys. I also hope that the State Department is going to expand this considerably because I think science as a kind of soft power in diplomacy can really make a difference for the whole world, not only for the U.S. and how it's received in the world. Just a couple of, Ken mentioned what Research America is about, but I've got just a couple of slides just to clarify it a little more, uh, what we are, a nonprofit with very broad membership of universities like this one, um, corporations that are stakeholders in research and do conduct research, patient groups, that's actually our, one of our larger categories of members, so the American Cancer Society, the Parkinson's Group, Alzheimer's Association, the Heart Association, lots and lots of those, and scientific and clinical professional societies. We have a spectacular board made up of people like Elias Serhuni, the former head of the NIH. We also have a former head of the FDA and former members of Congress. Um, outstanding leaders of the media. Susan Denser is a new member of our board, another person with a Dartmouth connection, of course. Um, I already said who's on the board. Uh, they all work for free as volunteers and they work hard. Here's our mission. We think of ourselves as innovators, so we think about the future all the time. What can we do that's innovative in advocacy? And our goals um, achieving more funding and achieving more awareness. I talked about the policy climate and importantly, <clears throat> helping empower others to be advocates. We're advocates, but there needs to be many more. Some of the things that we're known for and proud of um, are listed here, leadership in doubling the NIH budget. Uh, so, a huge thing for us. Uh, we also were the leadership group in assuring that some of the money, $10 billion to be exact, from the stimulus package of funds that was passed uh, now just about two years ago, some of that money went to research for health, $10 billion. So what's the current environment, the political environment, if you will, the public policy environment? for research for health, including global health research. These are all things that um, aren't rocket science, so speak. You, all, you know these are realities, but we have to keep them in mind all the time as we decide what programs to pursue and what partnerships we should form to pursue them. Um, it's very, the second point is especially important, as is the last one, that um, Right now, the science link, the talk in Washington when science is brought up is about jobs. It's about economic growth and competitiveness. And that doesn't come naturally to many people in the research community to talk in those terms, even though it's really not very hard to do when you just think about all the jobs, the good jobs, that are associated with the work that researchers are doing right now. It's, it's right there in front of us. It's palpable. We don't think about talking about it. Now, just a couple words about the recent health care reform bill. There was a little bit in it about research. You may be aware that comparative research was discussed. It's now been kind of renamed in the second bullet, patient centers outcomes research, sort of a mouthful. And what one would hope that all research is patient centered if it's about health, you know, after all. But sometimes stating the obvious is exactly what it takes to get over a negative pushback, and there was one around comparative effectiveness. So by reframing that, calling it the, the same <laughs> research, but using different sort of use, more user-friendly language, um, it's been reframed and uh, it's been funded with startup funding. You can read about some of the other um, research parts of the health care reform bill, which wasn't about research, really, but it had a little bit in it. So now we're into 
healthcare reform, and it's just starting, really, and there's lots of room for research at this point. There's lots of room for global health research. It is among the top five priorities of both the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And what we need it to have now is the money, the resources to realize the vision that we're hearing in both those agencies. So and now I want to switch and talk about immediate things, things that are happening, have happened, are coming up, that are ways, tried and true ways, that um, advocacy groups of all kinds try to capture the public's attention, the media's attention, and then translate that into policymaker action. So a week from today is World Malaria Day. And unless I miss my guess, you know, most people in this country are not going to hear about that. But over time, and hopefully not very many years, there may develop some momentum behind it. This is not our initiative, but we're going to work hard on trying to push out information about it using sort of factoids like this one, every 30 seconds a child dies from malaria. And there are things that can be done about that. And research is part of the answer. But I would challenge those of you who care about global health to use this as an example. Use this in a letter to the editor of a local newspaper here or in your hometown if you don't live and vote here to try to get this message across. A lot of people um, doing this will make a difference. We did this around World TB Day in March and you can find things on our website that are, are helpful to minimize the amount of time you might have to spend, but you could really make a difference and change that 30-second soundbite just by creating more attention to what the problem is and what some potential solutions are. So we actually have lots of tools that our members and others, because they're all, all of our tools are free on the website, available to anyone who's interested. Um, but the kinds of tools that we have include one that's provided in the materials outside, and you may have picked it up on global health, but we have others that are involved with, with globally related challenges, but also domestic, things that we think of as more domestic challenges. And the idea of these one-page fact sheets, whether in hard copy or electronic, is to get them into the hands of more people. And they always stress success stories, they all, you know, what good things have happened as a result of research, what the current challenges are, some things about what's going on now, and how to get there. And on the flip side, on the back side, there's typically some public opinion poll data and a map or other way to locate um, where you, if you particularly care about a, a part of the country or a particular uh, part of the world, you can, you can find out some factoids about that. Now, other things that we're doing on our, on our website, this is a screenshot, you can go on our website, anybody can go on our website, and people in the Congress, in the administration, routinely use our website for exactly this kind of data, up-to-date data mining purpose. They can click on a um, a state or a district and find out what kind of, in this case, National Institutes of Health funding is going on from the stimulus money, the so-called ARA funding. And there is some of that coming to New Hampshire. Um, I noticed after this slide was prepared, there's a, a bit that's gone to the Global Health Initiative here um, from the ARA funding, but also to projects that are named here. And if you, in all the controversy that's going on about whether the stimulus bill is a good idea or a bad idea and is it really creating jobs or not, very few people are talking about health research as a, a portion of it. And I think the people who ought to be talking about it are those that are receiving the grants to do this work and everybody who cares about it, the broader stakeholder community. So we have an immediate palpable, easy to communicate challenge here. There is also out, I don't have a slide with it, but also out on the tables, a one-page uh, fact sheet about global health R&D investment and why it matters to New Hampshire with little factoids. And I encourage you to take a look at that yourself, but then send it to somebody. Send it to your senators. Send it to people running for office this year. Send it to your congressman 
and say that this is really important. I've never heard you speak about this issue. I wish you would because it's making a difference for the world. It's making a difference right here now in New Hampshire to have funding going for research for global health. And it will continue to make a difference for a lot of people. Um, we need people to stand up and own it. This is also on our website, information about um, overall funding for research. And we know that one of the things people in general, as well as the media and elected officials care about is, are they getting, is their state getting their, quote, fair share, are they competitive, if you will, of getting federal dollars, tax dollars, for whatever endeavor. In this case, you can see that the state's population rank for New Hampshire is 41. And it's doing better than that in getting NIH funding. It's 35th. That's something to be proud of. Um, for sure. Not doing quite as well, it's covered over here, but not doing quite as well that 45 and 43 that has to do with CDC funding and National Science Foundation funding. Um, but that, the point is here to take a look at population rank compared to um, co competitive ranking of receiving federal support. This is something that taxpayers like to see, and the media and elected officials do as well. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our poll data, including some sort of fun aspects of it. Uh, this is, describes the methodology, and, and we can talk about that in Q&A as well. So why do we do public opinion polling, and why, in fact, are we in the business we're in of advocacy on behalf of the public for something we know the public supports? I think Abraham Lincoln captured this beautifully. Public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. But without it, nothing can succeed. So you have to know, where does the public stand on your issue if you hope to leverage public support or if you want to develop it or change its direction? You still have to know what it is. And that means keeping a finger on the pulse of public opinion, ideally with data rather than anecdote, although anecdote can be uh, both influential and thought-provoking. But we like to go with data on as many topics as we can from year to year um, and sometimes with trend data as well. So we see here, and we've seen this for a few years as the momentum for healthcare reform has been building and ultimately resulting in the passage of at least the first health care reform bill, uh, that people see research as part of the solution, not part of the problem. Now, that, that also includes that 29 percent, almost a third, almost a third, who think it's part of the problem. So we have to have answers to questions who are raised, that those folks are raising. But overwhelmingly, people think it's part of the solution. It always has been. The historical data will demonstrate that. But talking about it is important. Now, switching to global health here, we asked people whether compared to five years ago, you know, our hypothesis being there's more conversation about more interest in global health these days. So we asked people whether they think their elected officials think more or less or about the same about global health. And here you get a pretty much one-third, one-third, one-third split. And I've been doing public opinion polling analysis and commissioning polls for long enough to know that when you have this kind of split, it's really people don't know what's going on. So this is instructive. Um, and you know, a little trend data a few years from now will help. But meanwhile, we'd like to get those elected officials thinking about talking about and doing things about global health. Uh, very few are. This is a, just one example of many, on the record, members of Congress. This person, uh, Representative Simpson, happens to be on the Appropriations Committee, pointing out, and he was talking to a group of scientists, the obvious. We listen to the voters. He's never heard, he's been in the Congress quite a while, he's not once heard anyone at a public meeting ask him, what are you doing for medical research? Not even a researcher. Now, researchers typically don't go to public meetings, which is another challenge. But there are a lot of members of Congress who have told us this, either on the record in front of our group or a scientific group, or 
off the record, but say repeatedly say to us, we just never hear from the research community. And we know that's true on our end, too, because we get uh, members of, res of the research community who do connect with their members of Congress, typically know about us, have contacted us for help, or tell us how it went, which is usually good, usually went well. This is an example of a leader in Congress, one of, not, of only a handful who really get it about the need to invest in helping the rest of the world through research as well as through other means um, to stabilize their own environments, reduce and eliminate poverty, et cetera. You can read this. There aren't enough of these kinds of leaders. One of my colleagues took a look at the on-the-record statements of um, New Hampshire's delegation, couldn't find anything close to this. But that's not unique. It's true in many states. It's true in way too many places around the country. And that's a problem. It's going to take a while for that to change. So one of the tools that we have to try to stimulate that change is an online voter education initiative. This one is for sitting members of Congress. There's also one for candidates that will be launched soon. We've done it in previous election years. It's the same idea. We ask people who are running for office, or in the case of the first one, your Congress, your candidates who are in office, to respond in their own words to a series of relevant questions that have to do with health and research for health. And there's a question about global health as well. Then that goes up on the web. Anybody can access it. You can compare it to what the general public has to say. You can compare one person to another, either in Congress or running. You can immediately send an email thanking a member of Congress who you are part, you're their constituent, let's say. Thank them for taking this position or asking them to talk with you if you don't agree with their position or otherwise engage with them, um, which gets me to engaging with them. So this here's a little self-test. So um, imagine that you are at your local coffee emporium, whether it's Starbucks or something else. OK, there you are. Now, put up your hand if you would rec recognize your member of Congress, here or wherever you vote, if you would recognize your elected member of Congress if they were in there on the same errand, i.e. getting a cup of coffee. So put up your hand. Oh, that's pretty good. It's over half, maybe, people here. OK. Now, put up your hand if they would recognize you by sight. OK, we dropped off to two. OK. Um, this, I think you get the point, okay. Now, that member of Congress would recognize um, the principals of the elementary school in that community, the firemen, just a lot of firemen, um, the local dry cleaning establishment proprietor who employs some people. But they typically don't recognize because they have never met and talked to the people who are responsible for, directly or indirectly, responsible for the health, of the future health of this community, the state, the nation, the globe. They would like to be associated with the people who are responsible for the future of health because they know that the research community, the science community, the physician community included, is much more highly respected by the public than they are, members of Congress. I just read by, on my BlackBerry um, 45 minutes ago that a new Pew story has got Congress rated lower than all time of members, you know, the public saying they respect them. It's the lowest all-time ranking they've ever seen. But scientists are still highly respected. So challenge, being able to pass this test, when the science community can pass this at greater than 50% raising their hands, that their members of Congress know who they are and know what they're doing to serve the public's interest, will be in a whole new era of increased resources and policy support for the work we believe in and or do. Also dismal here in the poll data is this one. So this, we've asked this for years, and it's never changed. Um, 
approximately two-thirds of the citizenry, representative citizenry of this country cannot give the name. It doesn't have to be right, by the way. Can't give a name, just say they don't know of any institutions, companies, or organizations where medical or health research is conducted. How can that be, you say? May not be true in Hanover, New Hampshire, that it's two-thirds, but it is true nationwide. When you look, and we've seen this in various states, too. It's not a whole lot better in California or Massachusetts where there are many, many um, institutions conducting research. This is pretty dismal. And it means that we've got to do a better job of self-identifying where research is conducted. Um, this kind of dismal news extends also to uh, naming the federal agency that funds most of the medical research paid for by taxpayers in this country. This is part of a, a battery of questions where we give the mission of the agency and see if people can name it. So what do you suppose is the percentage of people that can name the agency responsible for collecting income taxes is? The percentage, it's, you know, it's 95 percent. People know it's the IRS. They know what NASA is. They have no idea what the NIH is, which has a much bigger budget than NASA, by the way. Nine percent. This has actually gone up a couple of percentage points over the last year, and we really don't know why. I hope it's not an outlier. I hope it's on a trend moving up. Um, but it is not good news. Now, technically, the 6 percent Department of Health and Human Services is accurate also, although combining that with health department is a leap of faith that respondents think are talking about federal health. Um, it's, it's miserable. This is just a miserable piece of data. Here's another bad one. Most Americans can't name a living scientist. And I mentioned this earlier, that scientists are invisible in our society. Now, this is living. We used to, when we started asking this question, we said, can you give me the name of a scientist? And overwhelmingly, everybody was dead. So we weren't capturing what we wanted. So we have several candidates for Elvis, like um, <laughs> alive and well here, Einstein, Pasteur, Curie, et cetera. But you can see this is pretty dismal, pretty dismal. And it's, it has a lot to do with the fact that the science community often does not self-identify out there in the general world, in the non-scientist world. So the people can't put a name or a face on science. I talked about public trust and that that uh, members of Congress are at a new all-time low. This is 2006 data. It's a little old, um, and we haven't asked this question lately ourselves, um, but we already know from other sources that Congress has taken a, a deep dive to the bottom end here. But for years and years and years, way before Research America even existed, people were asking this poll question, and it's always been doctors, teachers, and scientists at the top always highly trusted, even though people can't put a face on it. They may, of course, have a face on a doctor or a teacher, but not scientists. So our chairman, former member of Congress, um, John Porter, uh, who served from Illinois, likes to make this point that though perhaps they're not well understood, which we would posit is the fact, um, Scientists are highly respected in our side, in our society, and they're also, also highly credible. And then when they speak with a unified voice, people listen. It's that unified really makes a difference. And he speaks also from his experience in the Congress when members of, Con of the science community came to testify before his committee. He headed the Appropriations Committee responsible for NIH and CDC and related agencies for their funding. Um, there's some scientists who are very good and very persuasive and understandable, but there are few and far between. The science community is not skilled at because it's not valued particularly in the science community, a kind of communication to the public and to public policymakers. It's one of the things we work on uh, quite a bit, but we need all the help we can, we can get. We have a set of uh, principles based on uh, Mr. Porter's experience and advice, which you can find on our website, about how to have a good, positive, uh, helpful communication with your member of Congress. 
We also have a program that was stimulated by our former board chair, now deceased, Paul Rogers, who was a longtime member of Congress known as Mr. Health, both when he served and afterwards, um, that is uh, a society of distinguished researchers who've committed on a volunteer basis, could, committed a little bit of their time to be this kind of outreach agent for global health research in particular. And um, with funding from the Gates Foundation, we've put this in, in place and are taking the message to the media and to Capitol Hill and locally around um, the nation um, to the extent that our resources allow. Now, we call these outreach, agent, um, outreach agents ambassadors, not in the sense that Ken was once an ambassador and uh, in well deserving of that name with a capital A, but nonetheless, the concept is the same to reach out. You have one of our global health Paul Rogers ambassadors here at Dartmouth, actually splits his time, as I understand it, um, here, between here and Vanderbilt, Peter Wright who has a long-time commitment to Haiti and is also working with us to convey the importance of that committee commitment, which nobody would doubt at this point, um, but the importance of the research aspect of that commitment and supporting it at a higher level to members of Congress. Um, we have another program that's for everybody who's interested called New Voices for Research. Um, it, was, it was envisioned initially as uh, a way to empower young professionals in the science community in particular because they don't get a lot of support or empowerment to be outreach agents or ambassadors, if you will, small a, for research. But in fact, it's for anyone who's new to this and wants to kind of get their feet wet as a stakeholder or as a scientist. It's an online community with lots of opportunities and ideas and suggestions and positive reinforcement from others who've kind of gotten their feet wet. I commend it to you. It's a great program. People are having a lot of fun with it. So where do we go from here? Not just us, Research America, but everybody who cares about research for health, including global health. We think it's important to stay focused on the positives, on things that have already happened, that have had an impact, and of the promise for more, and the urgency for more. It's critically important right now to talk about the economic impact of investing in research, about how it creates, protects and creates good jobs, jobs that people aspire to for themselves, for their children, for their grandchildren. And it also drives the economy. It creates whole new enterprises, new businesses, biotech startups among them, but all kinds of businesses. It's important to know your elected representatives and know where they stand and use your influence as a voter to encourage them to be champions for research. We can help promulgate that message out, but we need people locally to start the process. We think it's critical to work not only in um, being an advocate of a particular kind of research that you know the most about, and can talk about most fluently, but to talk about the whole research enterprise so it doesn't become a contest of disease versus disease or type of research, um, uh, whether that's domestic versus global or basic versus clinical, to get away from those kinds of internal skirmishes and talk about all boats rising. Um, we need lots more people engaged, so that means uh, doing a little bit yourself and encouraging colleagues as well, and not only people in the research community, but people associated with it, people who care about the issue. You can sign up at no charge at all for our advocacy alerts and get involved in our programs any way you, you like, with the goal, I hope, of putting your face on research, on global health research, and making sure that people do know what you stand for and will act on it as a citizen themselves or as an elected official. There's lots of ways to connect to us, and I do hope that we hear from lots of you. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to take questions and comments. Is that right? And we've got microphones. We want people to...
take those. So let's start back there. Before you ask questions, okay. maybe you get the microphone in front. And tell us who you are. Tell me. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Dan Golub. I actually work at the Dartmouth Institute. So I'm fairly um, familiar with um, research and uh, health research in general. And I'm not sure if this is so much a question, um, but perhaps a, a comment, although I think it's a question built in, uh -huh. which is um, I think most people would agree that research um, obviously ends up um, producing advances. Um, and I think what some people would see, or and I see it myself, is you know, what percentage of sort of money, think about efficiency, what, how much is actually going to research and how much is going into action. And so you, like, you brought up malaria, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I've been in, involved in some, some global projects mm -hmm. where you see, you know, like um, having, you know, American researchers with all the overhead and, you know, $150,000 per person a year to study malaria and nets cost $2 each, you know, let's, let's just distribute some nets, you know, that sort of thing. Um, that I think, you know, science and, and I think NIH and et cetera could do better, mm -hmm. um, perhaps mm -hmm. sometimes thinking about that balance mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, analyzing the balance and perhaps, um, you know, allocating things differently. Well, you know, in my experience, the way NIH over the years has um, changed and altered its balance is when advocates insist on it. And that's, you know, think of other examples here, and there is more attention to nets um, for malaria prevention. Um, but we don't have all the answers to that either, by the way. You know, it's not just about throwing nets on out there for everybody to catch. We need to understand some of the behavioral aspects there, and that's the kind of research that needs funding and work. But, but other examples. So in the late 18, um, 18, 1980s, I'm not that old, okay. 1980s, um, HIV AIDS activists demanded that NIH put more money into AIDS research, which meant not taking it away from something else ultimately, but Congress putting that money in there, and that the FDA would speed up its regulatory process, and that NIH also would change and, and speed up its review process. Now that happened, it did happen. It happened over the objections of a lot of people who wanted to stick with the status quo. We've got to be careful, we've got to go slowly, we've got to do things the way we've always done them. But in fact, they did change. And they are, um, they are more than capable of changing. They have changed in many respects. When I was um, involved in the clinical trial that was described, Ken described in the introduction in the, in the early 1970s when it started, that trial, which he gave you the name of, Multiple Risk Factor Intervention Trial, acronym was Mr. Fit. It was Cardiovascular Risk Factor Intervention. It was only for men. And I and a lot of other, you know, well-informed people, leaders in cardiology and cardiology research in this country believed that anything that we discovered would apply to women. What were we thinking? You know? It took until 1992 for the National Institutes of Health to set a policy that said, we're not going to do that kind of thing anymore. And it, it already it was changing before we got to that policy statement. But it did change. And it changes for a combination of reasons, because there's better understanding of the science to date. There's advocates who demand change. That also was happening in the women's health movement, for sure. Um, and, and it changes because advocates influence the Congress who then get involved. And media plays a role in there, too. So I think your, your question is a good one, and I think it's, a, it's, always, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, and the NIH, the, best, the good news is NIH does respond. The bad news is it's not always fast enough, as, as many would like. But the message also is push, you know, speak up. Be an advocate, because it, it, there are listening, there are ears there that want to change and will change. It's a good question. Do we have the can we have the microphone because we're recording it? Yeah, that's, I know it's hard. To uh, I'm I'm Roger Masters in the government department. I do a lot of work on toxins and health, uh -huh. and one of the most striking things is how looking at 
environmental pollution and health mm -hmm. is considered impossible. In fact, we, I presented some, some evidence, published it, published it for 10 years, sent stuff to the CDC. I got attacked by people from the CDC who tried to pretend that our, our research was not true. Uh, and actually, their research confirmed our hypothesis, but that's another matter. Uh, <laughs> I served Change six months start. on the Get the Lead Out of Vermont Task Force. Uh -huh. I tried to raise the question of the role of lead in health. Mm -hmm. I was not allowed to have that even discussed by that group. People don't believe that toxins can affect health because everybody is so specialized and they just don't like to think out of the box. Yeah. And if you do, you, uh, I think Einstein put it very well, you're ignored for a long time then you're attacked, and then finally everybody always knew it. Yeah, yeah. You do get to that point. I mean, you sound like someone, Roger, who's not going to give up, and I applaud you for that. But the, the <coughs> I like the way you concluded that, that you know, you're attacked, you know, it's impossible until it's obvious. Then why did we even need to do the research? This is so obvious right from the start. And a very simple example of that is the fact that when I had my children, I put them on their stomachs to go to sleep. Everybody did. But now no one would dream of doing that. You know, it's the back to sleep campaign. Children are put on there, and there's been a huge decrease, just total drop off in um, crib deaths, infant mortality. Now, that didn't happen just because somebody thought of it one day. Hey, this is catchy, back to sleep. Let's, you know, spend some money on an ad campaign. Research was conducted for years with taxpayer dollars try to get at why are so many babies dying? You know, some people had different hypotheses. Other people laughed at them, poo-pooed them out of the room. And now it's just, I mean, are you kidding? You ever would put a baby on its stomach to go to sleep? Well, I did it, you know. So there's, there are many examples of this. But it takes the, the combination of the, getting the data, you know, let's have some real data here, pushing that data, lining up advocates, not being willing to say, take no for an answer. And, and, and it isn't, the data isn't always enough. Sometimes some, some more competing data come in there, as we know. But we, these days, everybody who wants to can essentially watch science in real time because of our networking, our communication capabilities. You know, we can watch Congress in real time we can watch sports anywhere in the world real time, and we can almost watch science in real time. And in some places, you actually can, through you know uh, cameras in laboratories and and the Broad Institute in Cambridge. You know, um, DNA sequencers on the street. You can watch what's going on. Now you have to want to, <laughs> you know. But we're watching. I think it's an opportunity for science, to, because we can start talking about yes people who aren't science trained and really don't understand how all this works. It's not about proving the obvious, and it's not about being right every step of the way. It's three steps forward, two steps back. It's a process. It's not linear, you know, et cetera. Science in real time shouldn't be something we're afraid of having the public see. We should embrace it and help them see its value to us all and ask us questions. Hi, my name is Kristen. I'm a student at the Dartmouth Institute. And I apologize if you went over this. I missed the first couple of minutes. But I was wondering if you had a sense of the understanding of and importance held for medical research and health research in other countries. And I ask because I wonder if there's a model for our research community to use to reach out to the political establishment, if anyone else does it better than we do. Um, I think we do it better than others do. Um, and my, what are my, what's my basis for saying that? We, uh, Research America, is regularly asked by uh, both researchers and um, policy people in other countries for information on how they can use what we know how to do there. And actually, sometimes it comes from disease advocates in other countries, too. But there is a much less robust, um, I can't think of any country that really has the same kind of robust disease advocacy um, uh, network that this country has. 
and it's just it's more built into our society. Uh, but we're asked, so I don't think that there's um, uh, there are other countries are better at this, but that doesn't mean we can't learn from them, of course. And in general, I think that uh, the United States does a very bad job of learning from other countries about health systems, about um, specific research. The research globally is pretty well, and researchers are very well connected these days. But on the systems, health systems and on healthcare delivery, uh, we're not learning what we can from other countries. And I think it's uh, largely due to an attitude of American exceptionalism. You know, we are better, smarter, you know. Um, we're here, after all, because we don't want to be in those other countries. And there's a lot of mis misinformation and hostility, but mostly misinformation that's the problem that's gotten in the way of healthcare reform. We had a, and I told a group of students about this earlier, we had a dinner in Washington in December with um, a current sitting member of Congress, some prior members of Congress, some other major health policy leaders and researchers, other thought leaders, about 30 people in a moderated so-called salon dinner. And this question of why can't we learn things from other countries whether it's research-related things, but it was all about health systems, not biomedical research, but health systems research. That was discussed for a while. And the member of Congress said that, and I just thought this was horrifying as well as uh, fascinating, that in the whole, by then, year plus of talking about health care reform in the Congress, there had never been a hearing at which people from other countries, experts from other countries, had been invited in to testify, which is sort of shocking, because if it were any other topic, that would have happened. We get expertise from wherever it is around the world. And secondly, there were never any visits made, you know, fact-finding visits made by members of Congress to other countries to find out what they could learn. Another thing that doesn't, you know, in other areas is constant. You know, we want to go find out why it is that they can build high-speed rail transit in France and Japan and a lot of other places, but we can't seem to figure out here. You go there and you find out what you can learn, members of Congress and their staff, and many other examples. Not health. So it's problematic, uh, you know, deeply troubling. I'm going to yep. ask my own question. Yep. I'm just going to move to the microphone. I'm calling on myself here for just a moment. Uh, I'm fascinated listening to this because at, our, at the Dickey Center, we also do a lot of work on um, climate change and, mm -hmm. and the impact of, of global warming and it's the same oh is this not recording i'm sorry, Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. i should have thought that's right they i thought it have was both. recording i was going to say that at the dickey center um, we're very interested in the whole question of, of climate change global warming mm -hmm. uh, and the impact on on human beings and um, the problem is very similar of getting policymakers, you know, to focus on the research and, and the science. Um, my question is, do you make any effort to sort of combine efforts, for example, the people who are doing, you know, the, the um, global health, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, climate change research, you know, to sort of just combine more generally on research, because you said that you, you try to not to disaggregate in terms of right. medical research. Mm -hmm. But my, uh, the other question I wanted to ask is one thing that we've noted uh, is the lack of scientific background of virtually all members of Congress. And is that getting to be an increasingly difficult uh, roadblock in, in your work? Okay. Well, two really good questions, Ken. Oh, so oh, for, sorry. Yeah, so I'm the only one that doesn't need that. <laughs> um, so uh, are we working with the... Uh, the science community and its advocates in the climate change environment? And the answer is a little bit. Um, there isn't any group like us in, the, in that um, community, although the Union of Concerned Scientists probably comes the closest, and we do work with them regularly. Um, we would like to do more. We're, our heart's in it, but our resource constraints are limited. But there is an awareness that this would be a good thing. So, you know, we've hit on something, and maybe we can talk offline about how to make more of that happen. Uh, the lack of scientists, science-trained people in the Congress is a real issue. 
but probably it's not one we're going to be able to do anything about immediately, so we can wait until that changes. I don't think it's likely to happen soon, or step out in other ways. So our chairman, for example, has frequently challenged the science community to go beyond um, being in touch occasionally, as I've described, and volunteer to, um, and this is the right time of the year to be, of uh, the congressional election cycle anyway, to do this, to volunteer to someone running for office, especially if they're a challenger, but also a sitting member, to um, join their scientific advisory committee and you know, work with them, and including helping them get elected. And they're going to say, well, I don't have a scientific advisory committee. They've got all kinds of other advisory committees. And you say, oh, really? OK, well, I think you should, and I'll help you form one. And that's when you get the climate scientists involved also. And, and the, you, know, you don't just necessarily stick to health-related research. That takes a real commitment, because now you're going to be putting in some serious time. But a few people have taken him up on this. And you know, there's models for it in other areas. And it is about trying to increase the science literacy, if you will, of that member of Congress and his or her staff. But it's critical to do that, if possible, before they are in office. Because if they haven't had much contact with the science community before they're elected, in a sense that scientists care that they're even elected, why would they take it up afterwards? At that point, if there's a pressing issue, and we got to think about volcanic ash or swine flu, they're going to turn to somebody in their staff and say, give me some expert who can help me figure this out. And often that expert is somebody else in the Congress who might have a credential that's more or less connected <laughs> to the field. But Ideology can get in the way of that kind of expertise, as we have seen in some recent examples. I won't go into all that, but um, yeah, it's a big challenge. So it's good you identified it. Let's see who we have. I'm Helen from the Tucker Foundation here, which administers service. And I apologize, I haven't seen the brochure, so perhaps it's addressed there. But I wondered if you are, it seems to me that this is at least in part a matter of civic education mm -hmm. about this aspect of our culture, our society, and whether you work with educators to either I, I would think to be developing researchers in the pipeline um, mm -hmm. and certainly mm -hmm. an appreciation mm -hmm. of research mm -hmm. and I wondered if you could address that. Yeah. We do, as my, this is another one of those um, resource limitation challenges, but we do a bit and many of our members do lots more with the science education community and the, and the advocates who are concerned about the, um, the dro terrible drop-off, really, in the commitment to science education that we've seen in this country over the last couple of decades. Um, much more needs to be done there. And I think there's a role for um, presidential leadership. And President Obama, in fact, has um, t been talking a bit, a little bit anyway, about the importance of science education. But there's roles for a lot more. Uh, members of uh, society as well. And if you're interested in exploring more of that, I think the group that has done the most interesting work on it is called Public Agenda. It's located in New York City. And the head of Public Agenda has been, she just rotated off, but has been on our board, which is how we came to know much more about this and I think is part of the reason that she undertook it, is an in-depth um, sort of civic engagement, as in your words, uh, look at what's in the way of science education moving, you know, getting back, <laughs> looping up, trending up instead of continuing down. And she's come up with, I'm not going to remember all the um, uh, factors here, but there were some very interesting ones about, that were counterintuitive to me anyway, about how parents were. It, weren't, it wasn't that they're hostile to science, 
or that they were worried it was too hard for their kids or some of those things you think might be going on. It was more that they were just so um, unhappy with the school systems, especially the public school systems in general, that that was just low on their list. So it, wasn't, it was less of a negative than just so many other things were ahead of it. So it's stimulating. They did a very stimulating report on that, which I would suggest that you access. Certainly influenced my thinking. Chris? Yeah. Chris. Hi, Chris Wolforth from the Dickey Center. Um, I'm wondering about what your metrics for success are. You've talked a lot about funding for uh -huh. health research. Uh -huh. Um, a lot of comparative statistics about what we spend other discretionary income on. Right. Um, and I'm, so I'm wondering, what would it take for you to close the doors of Research America and consider your job done? Right. Um, well, I, one of those metrics is uh, defeat of disease and disability. Now, you could already tell we'll never close our doors, right? But I don't mean to be glib about that. But, you know, just huge breakthroughs, you know, the elimination of diabetes because we'll be able to prevent it, both cure and prevent it. And I hesitate to say cancer because, you know, then we get to our doors will never close you know, because really so many diseases. So that's a kind of metric. Um, another kind of metric, though, is one that's often discussed is that the National Institutes of Health right now and other agencies, NSF, the CDC, ARC, are only able to fund 10 to 20 percent of the qualified applications they get for research projects. Qualified. Not the junk that gets thrown in the trash, but the qualified ones. But 10 to 20 percent just doesn't seem like enough to most people. And there's been a lot of conversation over the years about what's the right target amount so you know you're doing most, at least, of the excellent science and making sure that the people who are doing that science are going to stay in the field and have productive careers and make a difference so that we can solve our health problems. A lot of people would tell you that it's in the 35 to 40 percent range. A lot of patient ad scientists would tell you that, that that's the right number. A lot of patient advocates would push much more towards 60, 70 percent. So we're a long way from that. If we got up to those kind of percentages, um, and we had a lot of people like Howard Berman, who are sitting in the Congress talking about the importance of research for health, or John Porter's when he was still there, I'd say we'd make it. The other way we would make, uh, you know, the I thought you were going to ask about how do we evaluate the the worth of Research America, our you know our group. Um, just in and of itself, is if our funders, our members, stopped paying us dues, we know that we weren't doing the job anymore. We weren't doing the innovative advocacy. We weren't helping them be advocates, which is a big part of what we do. So we're funded. We don't have an endowment. We don't have a rich uncle. Or, you know, it's very, you know, we have to raise all of our money every year. And that's from people who see value in what we're doing. But it's the perfect question. It's a question my board asks me all the time. <laughs> Very good question. There's a question down here. Thank you. My name is Beth Barrett. I'm an uh, independent case manager. And I'm really surprised at the, uh, the percentages on the pharmaceutical, the collaboration between pharmacy and mm -hmm. scientific scientific institutions. Mm -hmm. My patients are always very skeptical of uh, that very issue. It seems like a conflict of interest mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the uh, pharmaceuticals who are going to patent the drug, charge exorbitant prices mm -hmm. for it, mm -hmm. and then uh, the, the scientists are contributing to their profits. <laughs> Right. It is a controversial issue right now, and that, that question that you're referring to isn't a question about do you think the pharmaceutical companies are greedy or are, um, have conflicts of interest, to which the answer would be yes, in very big, high percentage numbers. Um, the question is about do you think there's value, essentially, in collaboration? And that's um, an example of 
of us trying to get at where the positive value is, rather than say one more time what everybody already knows, that there's problems out there. So another way I talk about the pharmaceutical industry is that people overwhelmingly, certainly myself included, because I take two medications a day and will for the rest of my life, I presume, I want that industry to succeed, not fail. It's not the tobacco industry. That said, I think they've made a lot of mistakes and still are in terms of their business model and how it fails to capture our values as a population um, and still drive innovation, which they've got to do in order to succeed, which we want them to do. So collaborating with the academia, you know, with the non-for-profit side is one way we think that we can get all the forces who are trying to accomplish the same thing, i.e., come up with new and more successful approaches to curing, treating, preventing disease and disability is what we all should be pointed at and how our, our language should align and our values should align, et cetera. And we're not there yet. So I can understand why you hear those things. We hear them too. So, important. Anybody else who have we gotten to? A convenient stopping point, perhaps, Ken. <laughs> I'm getting a phone call. Okay. So you, you have to have a, a microphone to do that. I can lend you mine. Oh, here's mine. The, the question I wanted to ask is on the dialogue between science and policy. I mean, this C.P. Snow, I mean, people have written uh. on this for a long time already. But, you know, the question that I wanted to ask is, uh, you know, it seems that research uh, in a lot of fields is becoming more and more uh, technical with mm -hmm. language that only other researchers, you know, can understand. And how do you break the cycle between researchers who can't communicate with mm -hmm. policymakers because they simply can't understand it, or the, the research is presented in ways that they are almost unintelligible to them, uh, and, for, and to have the you know, policymakers be able to impart to the researchers sort of what is it that they need to be able to make right. decisions on? Right. Um, thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, we put a lot of work into helping members of the research community talk about what they do in language that non-scientists can understand and relate to and ultimately act on. <laughs> so uh, your question is great. So we suggest, first of all, that when a researcher is talking to a non-scientist, any scientist for that matter, talking to a non-scientist, and that person, it's a stranger, we're not talking about decision maker here, but a, a stranger, somebody sitting next to him on an airplane or something, says, so what do you do? Meaning, what do you do for a living? You know, we all get that question. And you say, instead of saying, I'm a molecular biologist, I'm a virologist, a paleontologist, whatever it is, you say, I work for you. You know, what you've done sociologically is change the balance of the relationship immediately into one that empowers the other person. So they're gonna ask you, we can play this out, you're gonna say, what do you, what do you mean? What, do you, what are you talking about, what do you mean? And I'd say, well, you pay taxes, don't you? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Um, and you're a consumer, and you, know, you spend money out there in the world, so anyway, some of your tax money goes from you to the IRS to the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and then back to me at Dartmouth to conduct research for health. Oh, that's fascinating. This person didn't know that for sure, didn't know that. Um, it's gonna say then, what kind of research do you do? That's the next question that comes once you've used the word research. So that's another challenge point in which you're gonna say, well, I do work that I hope ultimately will uh, lead to a cure for diabetes or whatever it is. You have to take that step even if you don't know that it's going to because um, you might be doing very basic research. It is necessary in the ordinary <laughs> dialogue of people, not scientists, um, to take a step to something they can relate to. So whether it's diabetes or HIV AIDS or something like that. Then you get into the next part of the conversation, 
which also works with decision makers, which we call the then, now, and imagine frame. It's really easy to remember when talking to anybody. You're on to your topic now. Now we're on to, let's say it's HIV AIDS, for sake of, of simplicity here. You can say, you remember 20 years ago that HIV AIDS was a death sentence. And it still is in some parts of the world. But in this country, 20 years ago, it was a death sentence because this country had been investing for some time in basic research on retrovirals. If you want to talk about that, we'll do that separately. Um, we were able fairly quickly to turn HIV AIDS into a chronic treatable disease. That's now. Research did that. What we're hoping for in the future, imagine, that we can have a vaccine for this disease, a la polio vaccine, and essentially eradicate it from our world. The only way that's going to happen is through research and investment in research. Very simple frame, then, now, imagine. Pretty much applies to anything. And if you use it once or twice, it's just built in. And you can do it in an elevator, then, now, and imagine, if you really have to, and, and uh, that's the real test. But it all comes back to I work for you, Change, you know, getting over the idea that I'm a um, highly educated, multi-degree holding, super duper expert, and I'm going to dazzle you, you know, is only going to work, you know, <laughs> for a few people you meet along the way, and they probably have similar credentials. Actually, and they're going to dazzle you back. You get into a contest, and what we really need is to get to the um, pick up the pen moment. A colleague of mine um, came up with this, and I think it's just brilliant. So when you're talking to a member of Congress or their staff, and you can very quickly get to the point where they say, tell me that again, I want to write it down. Or what is it again you want me to do? Let me make sure I tell my member of Congress that. And you're going to get there with conversation around then, now, and imagine, and here's a problem, we're working on a solution, solution, keyword, and the public supports us in doing this, and the public will support you, member of Congress, if you're a champion. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.